Thanks very much, Bob. I actually don't need the microphone because I have uh, a loud voice. <laughs> and if... Uh, okay, you, even with my voice, you need me to use the microphone. If you do, just give me, just lift your hand up and then I'll take, take the microphone. Well, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be with all of you here today. And I have to say that uh, it's a long road, as I reflected when uh, Pat sent me an email inviting me to give this lecture. I said, do you know, I, I first attended one of these close to 28 years ago. Now that tells you just how jaded you know, some of us are. <laughs> well, I was here as a student, uh, both Croatia and I were here as students, in 1987 and 88. With fellow student Wafa, we took classes together in epidemiology, and at that time the center had just been set up. And, uh, Sandra and Zena were busy creating the, the center, and uh, I, Anka, see, I, I, I put them together so often, and uh, we used to go to this Thursday morning uh, set of lectures, and it was a highlight, and I would wait for the Thursday morning because they often had very provocative and very interesting speakers, and I thoroughly enjoyed them. So it's a great pleasure to be with you here today and on, for change this time to be at the giving end rather than the receiving end of uh, one of these Thursday morning lectures. So what I want to do in the next 40 minutes or so is I want to share with you uh, some of the work that we've done as part of the uh, UNAIDS uh, Lancet Commission. And you need to know, just by way of background, the Lancet has been doing this in a range of topics. They organize these commissions, and they bring a lot of uh, high-powered people, but really the background work is done in quiet rooms, you know, before the meetings actually take place. And in trying to think through what this commission would contribute, we had to start thinking about where are we now, where have we come from, and how would we like to shape the future. Before I go on, let's want to check with Zina. Is that okay? Can you hear me okay? Or you want me to use the microphone? You're fine. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to tell you a little bit about in the beginning, just by way of context, this is a group I don't need to tell any I don't need to tell you anything about the beginning. You were there. Uh, and I want to talk about some of the recent trends as they impact on, on how we need to view the response. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the Commission report. Very briefly, you can read the detail of the Commission report. And I want to focus on the ongoing challenges, because that's going to be the big area of work we need to continue uh, as we think about what are those challenges in envisioning a future for the HIV epidemic. So in the beginning, as we reflect on how the HIV epidemic established itself from the first reported cases, and as we see the number of people living with HIV rising, and on the y-axis you're seeing uh, the millions of individuals who were becoming infected over the first 25 years. But as that was happening, a major global response was taking hold. And it was shaped by a whole range of things, not least all of the activism here in New York, in Washington, all over the world, in Brazil, in Africa. And we had several major milestones uh, or events that have impacted those first 25 years of the global AIDS response. And I've, in dark blue, just highlighted three scientific discoveries that have really had a marked impact on our understanding on, of HIV and on our response. Firstly, the discovery of the virus and an HIV test that followed, 
the discovery that AZT uh, prevents or reduces viral replication. And then from then on, the work from the 076 trial that shows that AZT not only is therapeutic, but also is effective in prevention. And since then, we've had lots and lots of new scientific discoveries. I'll talk about that a little later. But you can see that right from the beginning, science was a key part of the way in which we were responding and was providing the tools essential for the response. And in the midst of all of that, we had the, the community come together, the creation of GNP+, WHO's response, the creation of UN AIDS by the UN, and then you go down to the Durban AIDS conference, which was a pivotal moment in our response to HIV, and thereafter the creation of the Global Fund and PEPFAR and uh, the changes that resulted from that. But when we look at those first 25 years and look at the way in which the number of people living with HIV was increasing, in a way we were dealing with a crisis. And in fact, PEPFAR even says that, right? It's an emergency response. And so that's what we were seeing was this kind of picture in the first 25 years. However, if we look at the situation post-2005, in other words, if we look at the last 10 years, that situation is now changing. What we're seeing is a decline in HIV incidence rates. What we are seeing is uh, slowing down in the number of new infections that are occurring, both uh, and in the number of deaths that are occurring. And in a way, we sort of knew this was going to happen because epidemics are like that. You have this increase, you have a plateau, and then you have a decline. And that's how most epidemics, uh, that's their normal curve. And you know, each disease has some variation on that overall picture. But in HIV, one of the key things is that incidence started going down, in effect, long before the rollout of antiretroviral therapy. So what we were beginning to see was the impact of the natural history of the of, of the, the transmission of HIV. So if we look at the glo global number of new infections that are occurring each year, we are now in that part of the epidemic that's seeing this decline in the number of new infections occurring each year, to the point now where we are at about 2 million new infections each year. And one of the key factors that have that has also impacted on these changes, not just the natural course of an epidemic. But this was in the early 2000s, post the Durban AIDS conference, we had the substantial mobilization of new resources. And if you look at the way in which we had the steep incline in international resources, and then more recently, even domestic resources, that means countries affected by HIV are also starting to put their own money into the AIDS response. And so we had this uh, mobilization, and this assisted in imp increasing our HIV treatment coverage. And so we get this kind of picture where we have this rapid increase in the number of people on antiretroviral therapy. Indeed, we moved from about 2 million people on ART in 2005 to about 13.6 million people in 2013. It's estimated now we have close to 15 million people on antiretroviral treatment. So we've, we've had the benefit of this dramatic effect on increasing ART coverage. And this, you're all familiar with this because you, 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 you've been very much part and parcel of this, but just by way of background. But even with 15 million people on ART, our coverage, our ART coverage of those with HIV infection living in the world at 35 and 36 million people, we're still below 50% coverage. So while much has been achieved, there's even more needs to be done. And one of the, the real concerns that is emerging particularly within the UN framework, is that we are somewhat victims of success. There's a feeling that you know, this problem is solved now. It was, 
this problem has been beaten, or you've you've sort of broken the back of it, and so we you know we can we don't need to put all that energy into it anymore. We can now refocus on other things. And in 2009, when we had this global financial crisis, a change has occurred in the mobilization of resources to the point now where essentially what we are seeing is a, it's not quite flatlining, but it's the increases in annual expenditure on HIV has not been increasing in the same way that it did in the early part of the last decade. And indeed, what we've been seeing over the last few years, since pretty much the last three or four years, is that much of the new resources, the new money to aid the global AIDS response, that money has come from domestic sources. And it's reflected on the challenges the Global Fund has had to replenish its, uh, its, its funding. PEPFA has also slowly been flatlining and slowly declining in terms of the resources available. So what we are now seeing is a slight shift in the proportions from domestic to international spend. But overall, we are seeing a slowing down in the available resources. And so that was one of the key drivers for this commission that was established. And this commission was established to give direction in terms of how to shape the future response, and particularly to inform the UN system as the sustainable development goals are being developed, and also to guide UN AIDS in how to think about where to go with uh, this work. And, you know, so why another report? I don't know if you are as fed up of reports as I am, but, uh, you know, there seems to be a new report, you know, almost on a weekly basis here in our field. But I think one of the key things was to map out this critical juncture in the HIV epidemic. What is this point we are at? And what are the decisions we need to make? And how will they impact on the future? And so maps out those key steps in a way that are needed. So while we've seen the increase in, in treatment coverage, besides treatment, we've also seen amazing progress in terms of HIV prevention tools. I mean, if you just look at the way in which science has grown. So in uh, 2000, in June 2000, uh, uh, in June 2010, so that's some five years ago, six years ago, if you looked at the available evidence from randomized control trials with HIV incidence as the outcome, there are many other trials with other outcomes, but just focus on HIV incidence as the outcome. We literally had you know, the sum total of these three interventions, two of which were not considered worthy of pursuing because of, in the case of Mwanza, there were contradictory results. In the case of the vaccine, the efficacy level was thought to be too low. So, but what we, we did have a new, new technology that became available in the form of circumcision. So now if you look at moving from June 2010, to June 2012, in the two years that intervened, we had almost a doubling of the amount of new evidence that became available. So in the first 28 years of the HIV epidemic, versus in these two years between 2010 and 2012, we now start seeing a rapid increase in the number of trials emerging, looking at HIV incidents and looking at new technologies. And the focus here has largely been on the use of antiretrovirals for HIV prevention. And when the Lancet asked me to you know, try and capture where we are in the field, uh, I tried to sort of capture you know, where, what the results were telling us. And if you look at the situation in June 2015, as we speak today, I mean, this is a very busy diagram now, all of a sudden. From where we were barely five years ago to where we are now, it's really been a sea change in the, uh, the throughput of new trial results that have been coming through. Now, there were trials being undertaken prior to 2010, 
they were just generally bad news. And you know, we sort of got tired of, of hearing about all the bad news. But since then, we've been getting lots of good news. And they largely revolve around new technologies and largely around the way in which antiretrovirals could be used for, tre for prevention, either as treatment or as prophylaxis. The actual diagram I put into the Lancet is actually too big to fit on this. It, you can't even read it if I had to put it there. So that's how, that's how much the evidence has grown in these last five years. But despite all of this new evidence, and despite the way in which we've been gathering new data, we still have a very substantial epidemic. And in particular, in the setting that Croatia and I work, that in young women in Africa, we continue to see high rates of HIV infection. So this is a study Croatia did. So she's allowed to check her emails while I'm presenting this. <laughs> <laughs> because this is her data. So she knows this and she can have a short nap even if she wants. So I'm going to borrow from a study that, uh, that uh, Croatia did. And in this study, she took grade 9 and 10 school uh, uh, students and looked at HIV and a whole range of STDs and so on in these kids. And if we look at, in these uh, schools, the prevalence of HIV in the boys ranges from about 1% to about 1.8% across these different ages. So these are grade 9 and 10 uh, students. If you look at the prevalence in girls, the picture is dramatically different. So already by age 15, 2.6% of the girls have HIV infection. By the time they get to 16 and 17 year olds, which is the bulk in this grade 9 and 10 group, the prevalence is 6.1%. And as you get to the older girls within these grades, you're looking at pretty high HIV prevalence rates at 13.6 and 24.7%. And that's what translates into this kind of picture that we see at the seven uh, prenatal clinics that serve this rural community. So in these seven clinics every year, uh, going back to 2001, we have been collecting samples for one month in every year from every woman walking into those seven clinics for the first prenatal clinic visit. And the prevalence of HIV in this summary slide, if you look at it, these are pregnant women in these seven clinics. One third of them are teenagers. So only two thirds are above 20 years and above. The prevalence of HIV already by age 16 is 12%. So roughly, you know, if a teenager as young as 16 is walking into the clinic, you can pretty much say one out of 10 has HIV infection. By the time you get to an 18 year old, it's now one out of five that has HIV infection. When you start getting to 20 year olds, we're now talking about one out of three that has HIV infection. By the time you get to the 25 year olds, more than half of all women walking in, I mean the chance that a woman walking in pregnant is going to be HIV positive is more likely than not in this kind of setting. And we've been trying to understand this. We've been trying to understand what's the source of these infections. Why these high rates of infection in these young girls. And so Kirisha and the team also did another study where they sequenced the viruses in all the new infections that were identified in, this, in these schools, in these five schools. And what we've been doing is trying to understand whether there are linkages between these viruses. Can we get a better understanding of you know, who infects who in this kind of setting? In addition, she sequenced uh, 135 viruses from the community, just to get some idea of how the viruses within the school learners, how they relate to the viruses that are circulating within the community. And what's interesting is what we didn't find, as opposed to what we did find. So what we found was there were only two pairs. There were only two linkages that we could make. And only one of those 
related to two students, a boy and a girl from two different schools with the same virus. Every one of the other viruses we identified was a unique identified virus. So that told us a couple of things straight away. The first is, we're not dealing here with a sort of common source epidemic. We're not dealing with somebody who's sowing his oats and you know, infecting a whole lot of people. Right? It's not one virus that's responsible for this. Each virus is unique. So each one is coming out of a unique uh, pairing. And that whatever we are doing, we are not catching the other half of each pair. So the people we need to find are not in the schools and they're not in the community. And so that brings us to the challenge of what we're trying to do now, which is to try and capture the migrant men. We're trying to capture those people who come into this community on an ad hoc basis. And so that's part of a huge new study we're doing in the same community where we are screening 23,000 people in this community and all going to the taverns, the taxi ranks. We're catching anybody who comes even transiently into this community to try and find these linkages, to try and identify what are the patterns of transmission so we can better understand what underlies this transmission. And you can only do this kind of work and it's only meaningful if you have really good social science, anthropological and behavioral data to understand why the linkages are occurring. So at this critical point in the HIV epidemic, that despite all of this impressive progress that we've made, increasing treatment, increasing amount of research and new HIV prevention tools, rollout of circumcision, all of that, we still have worldwide 1.5 million deaths occurring. We have about 35, 36 million people living with HIV and still about 2 million new infections. And I think for me the thing that is really devastating is this number, that every day we have 6,000 new infections occurring. In South Africa alone, we have just over 1,000 new infections every day. I mean, that's the scale of the epidemic that we, we're grappling with. So UNAIDS has been doing some of these mathematical models. And if we simply continued doing what we were doing in 2013, you know, as if we look at the level of effort and the amount of coverage we were able to acquire and achieve in 2013, and we continued that at a constant rate and maintained that, that, that effort, they estimate that we will follow this red line, this this, uh, the red dots. So what will happen is that the number of people living with HIV will steadily increase. And this is uh, not, not people number of new infections with HIV. And this is partly due to demographic shift, that as you have younger people coming into the population, you get this increase in the number of new infections. So if we just continue doing what we were doing in 2013, we will see this kind of picture, that eventually, by 2030, we'll go up to about two and a half million new infections occurring each year. And so they undertook an analysis of what needs to be done to change that picture, and particularly what needs to be done to achieve the goals that have been set by UNAIDS. And one of those things was to look at what they call these ambitious fast-track targets. And if those targets are followed in the mathematical models. Now, I'm not a big fan of mathematical models, but the mathematical models tell us that we more or less will get to this kind of picture, and eventually by 2030, we'll have only 200,000 new infections occurring. And if you look at, in accumulation, we're talking about averting 28 million infections between these two scenarios. And what's critical in this is that the models tell us that you've got to act now, this is the time to act. To change the scenario from the red dots to the blue dots, we've got this window to act. Because if we don't act in that window, then basically this whole diagram shifts to the right. And we're no longer talking about averting 28 million. We now will have many of those 28 million infections actually occurring. 
But this is no mean task. I mean, to get from a situation in, you know, where we are seeing about 2 million infections a year to a situation where you've got 200,000, that's a tenfold decline, is not going to be any easy task. And so if you look at the overall prevention targets, what's very clear is that we are lagging in prevention. And this lagging in prevention is being particularly, part of it is just the natural course of the, the epidemic. So part of it is the way in which the number of new infections occurring each year has been going down anyway. But over the last few years, this decline has not been as rapid as we've seen in the past. And so there's the ability to actually get to any of the UNAIDS targets as they have been set we are unlikely to achieve them at the current rates. And if we look at where are these people living with HIV, globally, just 10 countries account for 61% of all people living with HIV. In fact, the top three countries, South Africa, Nigeria, and India, they account for one-third of the entire global epidemic, occurring just in three countries. Okay, granted, they're not small countries, uh, but you're talking about in three settings, we have one-third of the global HIV epidemic occurring. So what are these ongoing challenges? And I've sort of highlighted just three things. The first is our ability to translate effective interventions that have been shown in trial settings and in, in more pristine conditions to get that implemented to scale and really achieve its goals in real world and the real practice, that is a challenge. And so this, this ability to convert what we know as efficacious interventions, like uh, circumcision, like PrEP, like uh, and antiretroviral treatment coverage, to get all of those converted into real world, means the ability to deliver on the ground. And we are in many of these countries, particularly those first three countries, the health systems themselves have a high level of dysfunctionality. And so their ability to actually deliver on what we know works is going to be a major challenge. The second is that most of the new infections are now occurring in what UNAIDS calls key populations. In fact, young women is not called a key population. I took a bit of liberty in listing them here. As that. But where we're talking about sex workers, MSM, IDUs, and young women in Africa. That we're moving away from the, the generalized, large-scale community epidemics to ones which are more focused. And we have more identifiable targets, even within those top 10 countries. And then the third is the real challenges around stigma, discrimination, uh, and the legislative hurdles we have in dealing with them. I mean, in South Africa, for example, trying to do work with sex workers, is the, the legislative framework itself is such a challenge. So I just want to illustrate the problems we are grappling with in terms of dysfunctional health systems. Just I could, I could put 20 slides about those problems, stockouts and you know, staff training, staff attitudes, and so on. But if TB is anything to go by, and this is an epidemic we've been trying to deal with for many, many decades, and the level at which, you know, TB is in fact a growing problem rather than a receding problem, it, if that's anything to go by, we are not going to see the kinds of implementation effectiveness that we would like to see or would need to move to the blue dot scenario as opposed to the red dot scenario. And as we look at the number of new infections and the rates at which they are occurring in MSM across the different uh, regions of the world, indeed the MSM epidemic as we've seen it is one of the truly global ones that are occurring now. And almost it's in every region. And MSM have a disproportionately high burden of disease across the world. And for those who don't believe that it's a problem in Africa, 
Well, we have pretty high HIV prevalence rates in MSM in pretty much every country across that. From all the way from Cape to Cairo, we see pretty high prevalence rates of HIV. In injecting drug users, this continues to be a growing problem in Eastern Europe, in uh, many parts of Asia, and in uh, the Pacific region. And in sex workers in several countries, we continue to have high rates of new HIV infections that are occurring. And I've just highlighted in South Africa that sex work uh, prevalence in much of uh, sub-Saharan Africa is over 50 percent. That means more than half of the sex workers have HIV infection already. And when you're trying to deal with all of this in the midst of the stigma and the discrimination and uh, what that has brought to bear, just in terms of getting people into the service and to have them dealt with properly within the services is a challenge for them to come forward to be tested even. And I've, I guess this is the last group I need to show this to about the challenges that we're dealing with. So let's talk about envisioning a future and as I end off with. And I'm going to talk about the end of AIDS as a public health threat. Let me start by defining what that means. So if we look at traditionally in epidemiology, we talk about eradicating an epidemic or eradicating a disease or eliminating it as we, you know, trying to eliminate polio, for example, or eradicate smallpox. So those are the usual words that we understand, we can relate to, we know what it means, that, you know, we're not going to see another case occurring. So those don't really apply in HIV. So anybody who says, you know, I'm waiting for the end of AIDS, well, you've got a long way to wait because <laughs> we have 35 million people living with HIV and no cure. So AIDS is going to be with us, so an HIV infection is going to be with us for a long time to come. Unless somebody you know, discovers some miraculous cure. But I deal with many diseases like syphilis, where there is a cure. And they're not anywhere near elimination either. So I'm not even anticipating even with a cure we're going to get to that point. So I think to talk about the end of AIDS is really abstract. It's really not practical. It's, I think it's more aspirational. So when people talk about the end of AIDS, they're really talking about an aspiration. And it's the same whether you're going to call it the end of AIDS or you're going to talk about zero infections or it doesn't matter whatever words you want to use, but that idea is an aspirational one. And it's a good idea to have, and it's a good thing to have high aspirations. We need high aspirations, I guess. But if we talk about, you know, what's a step that would be a substantial leap forward towards the end of AIDS? And that's really about epidemic control. Can we get to a point where HIV is no longer a public health threat, a way we've got epidemic control? And so epidemic control is really about reducing incidence, prevalence, and morbidity to a locally acceptable level. Now, some people say, well, actually, zero is the only acceptable level. Well, let's find some midpoint. Let's, <laughs> let's find some point that, you know, we say that we've, we've sort of broken most of the, the challenge that this, this has raised. It's a point where HIV no longer represents a public health threat and no longer among the leading causes of disease burden. And there are mathematical ways of defining this. And they define it really in the reproductive rate of infection is when R0 is less than 1. In other words, at a point where the HIV epidemic is on the clear downward spiral. So it's working its way out to extinction. So if we look at the idea of you know, can we achieve epidemic control? Is it achievable? We don't have a vaccine, we don't have a cure. Well, many people have done mathematical models and the team at uh, UCL and London School have been working on this. And what they've shown is that if we implement the tools we have today, that's not even devising any new tools, just the tools we have today, whether it's PrEP, treatment, circumcision, Combining all of these tools, we could make a substantial impact on the epidemic. And so, essentially, yes, epidemic control is achievable. The mathematical models tell us that anyway. But that we can never get to elimination without a vaccine and a cure. So, we're really not talking, we don't have the tools 
to talk about elimination, but we have the tools to talk about epidemic control. So what is it going to take to achieve this? And here I can just refer you to the commission report in The Lancet. So the, the commission team did these four different scenarios, and I'll just walk you through them very quickly. So the one is the, uh, the blue line is one I've already talked to you about, which is what if we just did what we were doing in 2013, what they call a current effort. If we just did that, the blue line is more or less what we'll see in terms of the number of new infections that occur. What if we tried to achieve all of the global goals and laid out and did all of that effort? If we did that, then we'd follow the red line, which is the most desirable of the scenarios that we'd like to see. So what if we can't really achieve those goals, that they, they simply are too aspirational? So they did an alternate model, which is in the green line, which is what if countries were able to get to where the best country has got to? In other words, of all the countries dealing, with, for example, with IDUs and the transmission in IDUs, what country has done the best? And what if the other countries could also do similarly? So they did that in the green line, which is not too bad. And then what they said, what if we actually don't have funding to do anything more than you know, what we have now, and that we see basically a flat lining, and that's where we get to the purple line. So that's the financial constraint. So these are the four scenarios. Now, you know, part of the job of commissions like this is to make a case for more resources. So you can see that this makes a case for more resources. We'd like to be on the green and red line, not the purple or the blue line. But as we look at what it's going to take to get to that situation, the report outlines these seven, uh, these eight uh, uh, recommendations. The first is about, talks about getting serious about HIV prevention, expanding access to treatment, looking at sustainability. And a lot of the discussions within this report is about looking at domestic funding. In other words, we can't keep looking to the international community to fund the response. Countries have to find, and they, and they show quite clearly, many of the countries could be doing a lot more. Now, there are some countries that can't do more because they spend so little of their GDP uh, on, on health anyway that if they spend any more on HIV, they basically won't be able to provide polio vaccines. So it looks at all of that and maps out what the resource need is going to be and where the effort is going to need to come from. Also calling for better accountability with better data, uh, renewing of the leadership, particularly from the community of people living with AIDS, human rights, and then investing in research. And so I want to just end off by talking a little bit about investing in research. In that one of the key things we need in terms of new tools are tools that can impact the HIV epidemic in much of Southern Africa. And that is tools that can empower women, things that Anka and uh, Zina have been saying for, what, 20 years, 30 years or so. And so there are two trials currently underway that are looking at uh, vaginal rings. So these are a step forward in terms of making adherence more practical in that they need to be inserted only once a month as opposed to a pearl taken every day. And we had hoped that you know, things like gels would work, but what we've seen is from the trials that were undertaken, the voice trial and the fax trial, we have not seen efficacy in those two trials. So we have not seen gels and pills to some extent, not ha they haven't had the same amount of promise that we had hoped for. What we see is when, if you look at the adherence subgroups, we see efficacy. So if you take it, it works. But the problem is most of them are not taking it. And so if you look at this line that shows each of the trials, the size of the circle is a reflection of the number of HIV endpoints in the control arm. The green dots are the gel, the Tenofova gel studies. The red dots are the oral PrEP studies. And if you look at this relationship, the correlation is 0.88. So there's a pretty strong correlation between 
adherence as measured by drug levels and the efficacy that was observed in the trial. So we're pretty convinced that adherence is going to be a big thing to overcome if we're going to deal with this challenge of using antiretrovirals for prophylaxis or for treatment for that matter. And so one of the new approaches is to start thinking about how to not only enhance adherence but to find new technologies that make it easier to adhere. All of these technologies require adherence. It's just a question of whether you need to adhere daily versus monthly or three monthly. They all need adherence. So that's, you don't get away from adherence. Right? That's still fundamental. But one of the new drugs, a new class uh, that's being developed, both for treatment and for prevention, is uh, cabotegravir. So it's very similar to dolutegravir. It's a very good safe dolutegravir has a very good safety profile, highly efficacious in suppressing viral replication. And the idea here is to use cabotegravir as a once in three month injection. So the idea is to provide reproductive health services to young girls in schools in KwaZulu Natal. They come in once every three months and they get a shot of cabotegravir. And the idea is we hope that that will protect them from getting HIV. For those women who are already <clears throat> on contraceptives, that it could be linked to their contraceptive. For those <clears throat> who are coming anyway every three months for their Depo-Provera or net, net in, in, in injections every two months, this could be linked to that. So it becomes part and parcel of an integrated approach to reproductive health, not just HIV prevention. <clears throat> and Zina said, I can't give a talk without talking about broadly neutralizing antibodies. So, and one of the ways that, uh, one of the new technologies, as we've been seeing over the last few years, there have been over a dozen of these broadly neutralizing antibodies. Now, Everybody who gets infected with HIV develops antibodies against the virus. I mean, that's what we test for in the HIV ELISA test. We look for antibodies. But what happens is that by the time the body makes the antibody, by the time the antibody is developed by the B cells, the virus has evolved. So the antibody you've made is against a virus that was there. It's not there anymore. Right? So that's how the virus and the antibodies coexist in, in, in patients. <clears throat> the problem with antibodies that are normally made to HIV infection is they are very specific to the virus. So this antibody only <clears throat> neutralizes that virus that you had. <clears throat> it does not neutralize other viruses. It doesn't neutralize your new virus, for example. It is just focused on that original virus that it was mounting a response to. But what we've seen over the last few years is there are these rare individuals that can make antibodies that have much better breath. So they have, they, these antibodies can kill HIV across the spectrum. And in Kozil Natal, actually from one of our studies, we discovered one of these women. Her name is Caprisa 256. She has one of those uh, antibodies. Her antibody can kill about 70 to 80% of all viruses in these large panels of viruses we test. So we have panels of four to 600 viruses from all over the world, from all the continents. And put against that panel, she's got exceptionally good breath, particularly against clade C viruses. So what's unusual about her antibody is that HIV protects its surface and doesn't allow itself from being attacked by antibodies through its sugars. So it has sugars that cover the outer envelope. It's a bit like a, an M&M. You know, you sort of got to work through the sugar to get to the chocolate. <laughs> and in this particular instance, this antibody is able to get to the surface because it's got these long CDRH3 arms, the arms of the antibody. It is able to get through the sugars and reach the surface and is able to neutralize the virus in that way. 
So it's a very unusual antibody in that sense. It's also highly potent. And that's been a big challenge with antibodies, because they're expensive to make. And they're also difficult to get sufficient quantities into a human being. The antibodies we've had to date, like VRCO1 and so on, they've not been very potent, or not potent enough. This antibody is now one of the most potent antibodies available. So we need really small quantities to neutralize the virus. We've just completed the monkey studies. And the monkey studies show incredible promise. Basically, it protects monkeys against show challenge. Even at low doses, it's highly protective. So we're busy manufacturing this, because we've been able to isolate the B cell from this woman that makes this antibody. And we've been able to clone it and establish it in a cell line now. So we are now making this antibody. And the idea is to go into human trials. So like the way we've used zoster immune globulin and all of these kinds of passive immunoprophylaxis, the idea is a similar kind of passive immunity approach. That we give you an injection, you get your antibodies. Antibodies are long-lived anyway, so we expect they will probably be around for three, four months or so at least. So the idea, again, similar kind of approach. Get an injection, you are protected through these antibodies. So. Let me end off with saying that as we think about these new technologies, and these are new technologies I'm just focusing on, not on the stuff that's still pie in the sky. These are things we actually have in vials already uh, being tested. That we've made impressive progress in terms of scientific discovery, resource mobilization, political commitment, and so on. And we've created this favorable HIV trajectory. But we're really at a critical point in the epidemic. We've got to make some decisions. And if we are to really deal with the global epidemic, there has to be a strong focus on young women. They, they constitute the biggest single con contributor to new infections occurring worldwide. And that we cannot afford to miss this tipping point and risk losing the momentum against AIDS. So in other words, just doing what we did is not going to work. In fact. The epidemic today is so different from 10 years ago. If we're doing what we were doing 10 years ago, if we're doing that today, we're out of date. We've got to evolve. We've got to, we've got to be able to understand where the epidemic is going to and where we are so that we are on the money and know exactly what we're doing to reach the today's challenges today. There are many challenges, but it should not deter us. We won't end AIDS tomorrow but it has to be part of our long-term vision. Just remains for me to thank the many organizations that fund our work, and to all of you for coming here in the face of a potential long weekend for July 4th. I really appreciate your opportunity. Thank you very much.